So first of all, EPIC. EPIC is a not-for-profit industry association. Traditionally, we happen to be based in Paris because we have to be based somewhere, but the location is quite independent, it's not uh, relevant. But it's a truly not-for-profit legal status. We have a board of directors of seven members who are CEOs of our member companies. We are membership funded. We've got a 500 member companies who every year pay a membership fee between two, four, six, eight thousand, ten thousand euros. Most of them pay two, two thousand euros. These are usually small companies. Uh, we have 14 we have 14 employees who are all home based in different countries so we're a technology association so it's uh, we're european minded the european competitiveness oriented uh, but not political you know i include russia or india or whatever or switzerland you know it's just basically not the us and not uh, china but we're for therefore european competitiveness we exist uh, for 17 years and um, and so so that is about the association my personal background is I worked 16 years at the Semiconductor Equipment and Materials uh, Industry Association. This is a global industry association which exists for 50 years and the semiconductor industry is a mature industry. Uh, again, the association exists for 50 years and you, look, you can look up when the first chip was, was uh, created. But basically this is an industry that over 50 years has developed technology roadmaps, standards, market data, they have their exhibitions and their conferences. It is a well-established, mature, financially rich, you know, sustainable industry. Okay. Now the big difference with photonics, and you can look at what is photonics, um, but technology-wise, it's 80% about the same. You could argue, you know, you could argue if uh, the camera is an electronic thing or if it's a photonics thing. You know, photonics captures light. You know, this is a display. You know, it's made by electronics companies, but display emits light. It's photonics. So you can argue if it's electronics or photonics, but it doesn't matter. The big point is that the ecosystem for photonics is completely different. Uh, the ecosystem for photonics is much younger and, uh, and much, uh, it's younger companies and smaller companies. 86% of the companies in photonics are small companies. I even changed the definition of SME. As you know, in Europe, SME, I think uh, you're small or medium to 250 employees or something. I said, no, no, no. In photonics, 20 is small, 50 is medium and above 100 it's a large company okay so if you look at the thousand or two thousand companies in europe and you ask their employee size that is what the ecosystem looks like okay so this is as i said we have membership free for two four six eight ten but almost everybody pays two thousand euro because these are small companies so the ecosystem is different in terms of competition most of these companies do not compete and there is a very good reason that I, I think, it's not a fact, but this is my very strong suspicion and opinion. I recently interviewed 55 companies and uh, 43 of those, so 95% of the CEOs have a PhD. And I asked ah, them, interesting. it's very interesting. I always say photonics is high tech. Do you have proofs or facts? Listen, 95% of the founders have a PhD. So for me, that's a sign of high tech. It's not a financial guy. It's not an MBA guy. It's a PhD. So it's a high tech industry. And very often I ask them, what was the creation of the company? And it's a spin off of a university. So two uh -huh. things. One, if you're a spin off of a university, technology university, you're high tech oriented or innovation oriented. Two, if this is the work of your PhD, your PhD is usually working on something which nobody has done before. Okay. That's by definition what a PhD is about. Two, if you create a company, it's because there isn't such another company. You know, very few people would say, listen, I made a PhD on a search engine uh, and me and my friend, we like our search engine, but Google already exists and we're going to make a competition with Google. You know, so these companies very often are created precisely because it is a new technology or something new, which is not yet on the market. Now, this is different, for instance, if you say solar panels, if I now decide to make a company that is going to make solar cells, well, listen, there are many companies that make solar cells, you know, and I may choose, choose to do one in Belgium because there isn't one in Belgium, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, maybe that's true. But at a worldwide level, there are many companies that make solar cells or solar panels or machines for that. But that is the difference with photonics. It's very often a spin-off of a university and the guy has a PhD. Therefore, their innovations, technologies, products tend to be innovative, original, and there is not so much uh, competition. And this will not last, of course. But right now, we are at this very special stage. And the most provocative statement I can make is that is photonics an industry? Seriously, is it an industry? There is no global photonics association. There is very poor market data. There are no technology roadmaps. There are no standards. Seriously, are you an industry? Because that's not for me an industry. You know, that is not. 
So I think provocatively, I would say we're an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's an ecosystem, you know, with uh, a thousand universities and 5,000 companies developing towards an industry. So in terms of competitiveness, all of these companies, they work together. So you can have a big company. This is also a very interesting chapter maybe to explore is the vertical yeah. integration. In the semiconductor industry, 50 years ago, the guys who made the first chips, they used to make their own machines. And at some point they said, listen, the, the chip industry was big. And other guys said, listen, I'm gonna make the machines for you. And that's the only thing they do. They make machines and they make better machines. And then the chip maker said, well, I'm not gonna do machines anymore because you do them better than me. And they are cheaper than me, so they gave up. So then everybody did his own thing. Somebody made the chips, somebody made the machines, somebody made them, it was, okay. I don't know what is the opposite of vertical integration, but it's the opposite. In photonics, it's not the case. There is a lot of vertical consolidation. A guy makes a fiber laser, he makes the laser, he will buy a fiber company and he will buy the optics company. So he, we are at a stage where a lot of companies in photonics are vertically integrated. So this means that because he has all of these various steps in the value chain, you may have a company which is at the same time, this is unbelievable, you have I can show you two companies who are at the same time competitors, suppliers and customers, different departments of the yes, company. Yes, exactly, and that's the interesting part, like how collaborative, you know, you can see the ecosystem, how you can bring something new, like is beneficial for all of them. Yes, so first of all, you do have companies, because if you take two car companies, they only compete, BMW and Audi only compete, they don't sell to each other, and they do not buy from each other, maybe they do some joint research for your project, but, but you don't have this. Um, but in, in this specific case, you have companies which are competitors and suppliers. Let me give you an, an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to find a, a more generic uh, example. Uh, you make a fiber laser, it's a kind of laser. And, and to make that laser, you need to buy fibers. Okay, so you've got a company A, they make lasers, company B makes lasers, and they buy a company that makes fibers. So now this fiber company belongs to one of them, but he keeps selling to everybody, sure. So, but they are, they, these two are competing, but he's buying fibers from that. So at the same time, they are competing, but he's buying from that guy. Okay, yeah. so this is the example. So how do they collaborate? Um, I don't know if it is the case, but at least in our consortium, we're trying to open their minds to the fact that, listen, we are not yet at a mature industry where you have to fight. We have to create a bigger cake. Okay, so first of all, it's let's work together to expand the applications of photonics. Let's make the pie bigger and yeah. then you guys can go and fight. My <laughs> big criticism to the solar industry is that the solar companies were fighting to each other and the regions were fighting with each other. While in fact, they should all have united to fight against petroleum or wind or some other stuff. So I always regretted I couldn't, uh, it was not our job either, but, but the solar industry, in my view, they failed. They fought each other rather than fighting a common enemy like nuclear or petroleum or something like that. Exactly, and this is the interesting part to think about either competition or either collaboration. You know, like you are stronger together and you can build much more, like thinking about open mind and a mindset of abundance instead of, you know, like being restricted with the resources. So uh, if you, the iPhone of photonics does not exist. Uh, we are not at a laptop stage. We're not at a desktop stage, but we're also not, you know, the computers used to take a whole room, you know, we're not at that age either. So we're somewhere between a big mainframe computer. That's where we're in photonics. So there's much to go. What will open the market? Lower price and more applications and better resolution and stuff. To have lower price, you need more volume, okay? And to have more volume, you need higher, uh, lower price and, and the, what is it the story you know what i mean you know mm -hmm. to have it cheaper you need to produce more to produce more you need it to be cheaper that's how you open the market you know so we are at the stage where all of these photonics companies they are all step by step improving the performance reducing the price step by step by step therefore in opening markets opening markets so we are in a very positive cycle of opening markets, price reduction, opening markets. So we are at that stage and this benefits all of us, okay? Yeah. What we do at Epic uh, in our organization, so usually we know our members very well. We have members in 33 countries. 
we spend a lot of uh, effort in networking events to build the trust. So I believe what is needed is two things for this uh, industry to be successful and sustainable and innovative, is trust and knowledge of what the companies do. We organize technology yeah. meetings where the people get to learn about what does your company do. And in a small environment with only maybe 50 or 100 people, we talk about what are your challenges and what are your roadmaps, okay? You cannot talk about this in a very, very wide audience with a thousand people or anonymous because it is your roadmap, you know, it is your problems. You don't yeah. want others to know your problems. You don't want to know others to know what is your roadmap. But we take care in a, in a controlled, reduced environment that they can talk. So they know what they are doing. Two, we have long coffee breaks, lunch breaks, networking receptions and that. We invest a lot. We invest 20% of our revenue into networking activities to build the trust. Okay, so now I know what you do. I know what are your problems. And by the way, I like you. You know, we should do something together. And that will then drop down into partnerships and collaborations. You cannot have such a spirit in an industry where the people don't know. They, are, they, they just say, oh, you're a competitor. No, no, I know about you. You told me about your stuff. So trust and knowledge. And this is super important because that's the basics of the innovation and collaboration. It's like sharing knowledge, sharing information. If we are not talking to each other, it's impossible to innovate. It's impossible to collaborate. And the I think- The big sentence for me is, it's not how much you know, it's how much you're willing to share with me. Exactly. This open mind of sharing knowledge. Yeah, totally. Okay. So what we need is to have people who are knowledgeable. The people who come to our meetings need to meet three criteria. They are technology knowledgeable, they understand yeah. it. They know what they are saying and doing. They need to understand the stuff, you know. To your business minded, we are an industry association. It's not blue sky research of stuff in five or 10 years, okay? It's problems that we can solve in six months to two or three years, okay? And three, you are nice. And I sincerely mean it. 98% yeah, yeah. of the people who come to our meetings are nice. How comes that we're a filter of nice people? Because <laughs> I like this. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, couple of uh, There is an answer. You don't have to be a member and you don't have to come to our meetings. There's really no obligation. So the people who are a member is voluntary. The people who come to the meetings and are a member, it's voluntary. They are nice people. And also we try to not have people who are just sales oriented. You know, so a nice person, my definition is somebody who's gonna meet you and who says like, okay, so what do you do? How can we help? Okay, yeah. instead of I make this, do you want it? Okay, yeah, totally. so it ends yeah. up in business. Very good right? point, very good point. Carla. Yeah, so the result, the end result is kind of the same, you know, but it's different to say like, I do this, could that solve your problem from, what is your problem? Say, well, I cannot help you, but I know somebody who can help you. Let me take you and introduce you to him. Yeah, that's, that's the sense of the community as well. It's not only an ecosystem, you are creating a, a community for photonics. Now, there is another characteristic in our industry is that 90% I, I, epic deals usually at an executive level, CEO or CTOs. 90% of these people in 20 years, it's still the same guys. When you're in an executive position, you tend to stay in an executive position. And if you're in photonics, which is a leading edge technology, you're not gonna go and sell cookies. So now these people, they know each other for 20, 30 years, yeah. or maybe they will work for another 20 years. It is a stable community. Remember, I said in Europe, you have 5,000 companies, not 50,000 and not 100. And, and 5,000, out of those 5,000, let's exclude the universities, let's exclude the, the end users, the clients. Epic is gonna become an association of about 1,000 members. And 1,000, it's a lot. But it's still okay, you know, a thousand people. You know, you go to an exhibition, you meet 300, 400 people over the five, over the whole week. So it's still a manageable size. So what are the outcomes and the results for the ecosystem and the individual company? I, Epic, everything that Epic does is for European competitiveness. And competitiveness doesn't mean that I want Europe to be the number one. I just want us to be part of the game. Uh, we had been leading in some industries like microelectronics, LED lighting or solar, but it's all gone. We are not a leader at all. We're actually not even part of the game uh, in most of these fields. We do nothing in solar and we do nothing in lighting. My ambition is that we're still strong. Today in several photonics fields, we are leaders, but there is no guarantee for that in the next 20 years. I mean, I have yeah. to learn from the past. In the past, Germany was leading in solars. Two years later, they were not leading anymore, okay? So the lessons learned is how to be competitive. And this is my answer or my strategy for competitiveness of a sector. It is not subsidies for research. Yeah. It is not subsidies of manufacturing. Because if that was the answer, 
If Europe says we're going to put 1 billion into funding research for photonics because it's a key enabling technology important for digital sovereignty, if that was the answer, then another competing region, China, would say like, photonics is interesting, we want to lead, Europe is giving 1 billion, we're going to give 5 billion, and then you get screwed. Okay? If you subsidize manufacturing, the same thing. If money was the answer, then anybody who has more money will be better. My strategy is indeed building that very strong ecosystem of these 1,000, 2,000 people, CEO, CTO, who know each other, who have a trust relationship, who work together, who generally try to, to work and to help each other, yes. so that anytime you have a problem, you call up somebody and says, yes, sure, I'll help you. And yeah. building that network of 1,000 people is my answer to European competitiveness. And if that is something yeah. which is going to save the industry, it is very hard to copy. It takes yeah. years. And actually putting money into it, it probably would do the opposite stuff, okay? Yeah. This is a bunch of friends who help each other. And that is my answer to European competitiveness, which is hard to replicate. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the key essence of collaboration as an industry, you know? Like, this is the incredible mindset you are creating with Epic. I think, like, you are unique. That's the uniqueness. Epic is trying to have a, a vision to be a steward to the industry that's sharing that image of we have to work together. And even if we compete, we, I always say, let the salespeople compete. The CEOs, you know, we talk, let the salespeople compete. You have this cooperate, you know, what is it, competition sentences. I also like the other ones, you know, we compete from nine to six, but afterwards <laughs> we're partners. Sure, afterwards is the evening reception, we have a beer together, you know, but during the day, of course, at the exhibition, we're, we're fiercely. So there are really two things, which is indeed a competition, but I really, it, it's a respect of each other. And by talking from each other, we get to, to understand each other better. You know, it's just, I think in private people also, you know, we may not like each other, but if we get to know each other better, actually we will appreciate each other. Yeah, and like we are human beings, you know, like the essence of all the business is about relationships and the importance to build this relationship and to share this knowledge is like, bringing people together to make something happen. Especially in an industry which is smaller companies. Again, if we yeah. were with companies which is mainly 10,000 employees, it's not the same. But remember, 86% of our members are small companies. That means it's a company of 50 to 100 employees. The CEO knows all of the employees. The CEO has a strong influence among all of these companies. And in my case, we have had a reception with 272 CEO by job title strictly only. Okay, 272 CEOs, four hours. The door is open, it's in the middle of San Francisco. They can walk in and out at any time. They just stay till the end. So for me, the proof that they like it. So seriously, we rented the Museum of Modern Arts in the middle of San Francisco. It's in the middle of the largest exhibition in the world. And we have a party and they just stay. They just stay and drink and talk. Obviously, they, some... CEOs, they don't come because it's free food or free drinks and they could do other stuff, but they really, See, for me, that was the, the proof that they see the value of getting to talk to each other. And I can give free open bar. These are CEOs. They don't drink. Nobody gets drunk. except No, on the no, no, because you have to do business. You have to understand the other person. <laughs> you have a cup of tea and coffee then. No, they have a beer. These are Europeans. They have a beer and a wine, but no abuse, no excess. Again, we're dealing with PhD educated level people who are yeah. CEOs of a company. We all know each other and, and they stay. Four hours, it's a long, well, you know, you can go out, but yeah, we start usually at six and we do till 10 o'clock. So you have uh, advice for ecosystems which are very close, like even a small ones, like say, ah, I don't want to share the, this industry of members I have. I, I want to control the connection they have with each other. I want, which kind of advice you can give to them? Yes. So it's, you first have to start with building a trust relationship with the people. So if you take a community, let would say that would be extremely, some communities are extremely open. The people who deal with safety, safety of buildings, of in factories, you know, these people care about the human health. You take people who are safety in various companies, they are very open and they share because we all want to save lives. These are the most open community. A very close community would be salespeople. You know, they are very not, not selfish is the wrong word, but they, are, they have a sole purpose, which is you know, for their company and to sell. You have to give the time to the people to get to know each other. So when you organize a conference or something, give them time, make a reception. We always have a reception and a dinner. 
we organized runs we organized runnings in san francisco at 6 30. Oh, really? nice. yeah. we organized a run at 6 30 it's 50 ceos and they sweat together and, and <laughs> it's bloody ridiculous it's 6 30 in the morning on the on the pier it's uh, is the ferry building in san francisco every in february every february at 6 30 these guys meet <laughs> And, and you know they run and they sweat and some walk it's walkers or runners it's not a competition you know and then they have a breakfast together orange juice and the muffin and the coffee and the whole thing allow time for the people to get to know each other personally let them build the trust and then you can go into into discussions which are more related to collaboration and where you put aside the competitiveness uh, aspect yeah and um, as a you as a leader of the ecosystem for photonics the advice to another leader from other associations like they are doing more competitive instead of collaboration mindset what is the advice for the leader to change this mindset and, and yes the other association is focused on what on, on i don't know could be whatever i don't i don't want to give names but like any kind of uh, technology we can say and they are super close and they don't want to the, the sector which is talk. closed is it because of the leader who is closed is it yeah the leader i think the leader is the gate keep gatekeeper we can say so some people believe in networking and some people don't mm -hmm. i've experienced that um, i wouldn't say that it's necessarily shy people but you have people who just think this Paying Epic 2,000 euros to be part of this networking association, it's bullshit. I'm not wasting my money. Some people don't believe it. The people who don't believe it, you can do nothing about it. Uh, and I say it's like God. You either believe in God or you don't. And if you don't believe in God, I can give you all of the facts. I can give you facts why people benefit of the networking. But if you don't believe, it won't help. I can give you all of the facts you still will not believe. If the leader himself does not believe in the power of networking, um, then you, 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 you can't. The leader of an association decides where he spends the money. Uh, I decide to not have an assistant, which saves me uh, 75,000 euros per year, which means that I can organize an, an enormous amount of networking and receptions, okay? Yeah. Uh, it means I have to work harder because I don't have an assistant, but if a party costs 50 euros per person and you have 75,000, that is 1,500 people, okay? So by not having an assistant, I can organize networking events for 1,500 people per year, okay? So you divide that by 100 people per party, that's 150, okay? So if my math is right, I can organize a 100 party of 150 people. So if I can smell, no, that's too much, it's the opposite. Yeah, I can organize 10 parties for 150 people. Well, you make the math yourself, but you know, <laughs> So if the person, this, if the leader of the, of, the, of the association does not believe in networking, you're screwed because he decides on the activities, <laughs> on, on who to invite, on how much to spend or what to do. Yeah. Um, and to see the value, you know, of bringing people together, you know, that's, that's the... No, the, the, I changed my title from Secretary General to Director General for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One is because uh, at, at the European Commission level, Director General is a higher level. You know, these are, the, the, that's how they yeah. call it. You know, in companies, they say CEO, uh, VP, Directors, and the European Commission is the President, the Vice President, the Director General. So that's one. But I also believe that in, just in the terms of the wording from Secretary General, and the United Nations have a Secretary General, but I think that our associations have indeed evolved from being, I'm not just a secretary who is being told to do, I feel that I have, I play a very proactive role in making yeah. suggestions and recommendations. The board decides, but I still play a very proactive role. And I think that it is that proactive role that um, entitles me to have a word, the title of, of director. You know, I'm very proactive in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 the director generals of the associations play a very influential and, and role, you know, they, they guide to all of the staff and the budgets and, and, and all of that. Yeah. Uh, and even if they are instructed by their board what to do, you know, if you don't put the heart into it, it's not going to work. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, like you care, you know, what you are doing. And that's the, the part of this leadership, you know, the, the good, kind leadership, we can say, like you care about what you are doing. And yes, about I, the I am, I am. Uh, this is the selection of, of, uh, of, of, of the director general of the association. In my personal case, yes, I am not a uh, profit driven. Uh, I am not career driven. I, I'm just, uh, I'm enjoying the job very much. 
I'm not a job hopper. You know, I stayed 16 years in the semiconductor association and I just left because I wanted to bring the experience of a mature industry to an emerging industry. I didn't leave because I wasn't happy. Do the transformation, yeah. Well, just, you know, you, you want to, to, yes, I wanted to, I build experience in this mature industry and I saw that hmm, maybe, and this mature industry didn't, in my view, need me or the association anymore. They know their stuff. But you know what? With this experience, maybe I can help another sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And only one question. I, 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 I was curious how, because you, some months ago, you were looking for investment and funding to, to make it stronger against the other Chinese or American uh, ecosystem for photonics. So how do you believe investment is helping your ecosystem? Okay, so first, I never say Chinese or Americans, I always yeah, say well, European entities, okay? Yeah. So that is the politically correct wording, I say non-European. Uh, the reason that investment is very important is because I want the companies to remain European. Uh, why? Um, because, because when a company is not doing well and they have to close factories or offices, very often they are tempted to close in their non-home country. And that's that's one point two uh in in the case of of again photonics technologies is extremely important for military applications for data communications for sovereignty as a continent you need to be able to control this and the examples of the whole story about the 5g and huawei is an example when you don't own these technologies when you don't control these technologies so so for employment for research for for employment for research for sovereignty uh, for reward, you know, these are spin-offs of a university. His studies were, were subsidized. The, the spin-off was subsidized. He got EU project was subsidized. In the end, I, I, you want to have a company which is existing in Europe, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. We all wish we had a Google and a Facebook and uh, these kind of companies, you know? We, of course, we wish. Um, so if companies don't have access to money, that's the wrong start. So if a company at some point they need money, to grow, to build a new factory. If they don't find the money in Europe, after you, you try, we're all Europeans, of course we want to work with Europeans, you know, unless sometimes strategically you should find a partner in the US or in China, you know, but a part of, of, of access to the market, but usually you want. But if you don't find the money in Europe, you'll just take any money <laughs> because you're desperate. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if you take a VC, a venture capitalist, he will invest in your company and he will want to sell you to the guy who's gonna bid the most money. And some countries have a very proactive, ambitious approach that they will just put the money on the table and they just buy companies. You buy a company, but in this case, I feel you're buying a company, you're buying a sector, a whole industry, and almost our soul. You know, the people who run these companies, they put energy, you know, they sacrifice mm -hmm. their weekends and their weekends with their families. A lot mm -hmm. of heart, you know, I always say, like when my wife cooks, you know, I say she cooks also with the heart. There is love into this yeah, meal, it's exactly. not just a meal. And these companies, there is sweat and dreams and frustration into these companies. It is not there just to be bought with money by somebody else. Yeah, exactly. So it's important that they have access in Europe from good sources uh, so that they can remain in European ownership or in European environment. Yeah. Thank you very much, Carlos. Okay, my pleasure. An, an amazing Q and A, and um, I think that's why I, I chose you for for being an example of the book. I think because that's that's impressive. Even talking about caring and love in a photonics industry, like and how you know how to bring all together to make it happen. That's that's not normal, and I think that you you are you are special. There's a lot of passion and energy into these companies. And, and these companies, again, PhD driven, and I'm not sure it will last, you know, uh, maybe we are the last generation, it's like the third generation, you know, in, in private it's also like this, you know, your grandfather, he, he sweated, he made a company, he became rich, his son saw him becoming rich, the third generation, he just saw everybody being rich, he's not used to work, he didn't see the, the sweating and he just uh, spent the money, <laughs> very classical. And in this case, the people who are CEOs today, who are 55, when they started, there was no industry at all. They started with the passion. Yeah. The guys who are starting a company today, they are maybe 25, 30 years old. They started studying 10 years ago. There was also no industry. Okay, so the guys who are 55 in photonics, who are 30 in photonics, they all started because they like it by passion. Now, in 20 years from now, it may be different. You know, maybe in 20 years, photonics is the big success. 
and the young people study an MBA and they want to become money. But we're at a unique turning point uh, that this is this generation that is for sure, they are all passionate people. And which is also one of the reasons I deal with nice people. They are passion driven. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, good. Well, Carla, thank you very much. All the best. Mm -hmm. and